We have a, a great session coming up now. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Josh come up uh, to have a, uh, have a conversation with uh, Rob Curtis, who is the Managing Director and Co-CEO of AM Best Singapore. Welcome. All right. Well, we're going to keep the energy up. Uh, we're getting uh, close to the end of the, uh, the, the first part uh, of the conference. Uh, and this is just going to be a little fun. We're going to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, talk a little bit about uh, the regulatory market from a unique perspective, from the perspective uh, from the rating agencies, uh, especially given uh, my, uh, my guest's background. So uh, I'd like to introduce Rob Curtis. Rob is the Managing Director for Market Development for the Asia-Pacific region, as well as the co-CEO of AM Best Singapore uh, subsidiary. Based here in Singapore, he's responsible for the company's strategic market development for the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, Rob has more than three decades of experience in the insurance industry, and prior to joining AM Best uh, in 2022, uh, he was the head of the major groups and technical expert teams at Hong Kong's Insurance Authority, uh, responsible for the development of Hong Kong's new group-wide supervision and macro-prudential frameworks. Uh, additionally, he was the chair of the International Association of Insur uh, Insurance Supervisors, working group on group-wide supervision during his time at the regulatory body. Prior to the IA, Rob was KPMG's global regulatory lead for insurance, while concurrently heading up the Asia-Pacific uh, Insurance Risk and Regulatory Practice. So welcome, Rob. Thank you for Thanks, joining me today. Uh, so we're going to jump right into it. I have a couple questions. We'll have a nice conversation, then we'll open it up to any questions. So firstly, uh, globally, uh, ESG in, uh, particularly, uh, is particularly topical, and we've heard about it throughout today. Uh, I'm interested in whether you can give us some insights on to how CRAs typically incorporate ESG considerations into their ratings methodologies. Yeah, sure, Josh, and uh, afternoon, everyone. I, I think it's important to understand from a CRA perspective, or well, particularly from AM Best, I can talk from that uh, personal perspective at least. We, we view that purely, uh, the ESG, uh, from a uh, purely analytical perspective. So we mean that by focusing on the impact of the, on the credit rating itself. So uh, there's no judgment in that sense made on the ethical value of ESG uh, activities or ESG credentials of the company. And so the ESG factors and where they're material, of course, and relevant, uh, may impact uh, uh, on any of the different areas of our building blocks and so just to, of, our, of our rating assessment. So just to give you an example, you know, the balance sheet strength, for example, uh, that uh, uh, examines climate risk, uh, ESG integration in investing activities and, and stranded assets. So that is already part of the rating methodology, if you like, so it's not something necessarily new because of ESG. Similarly, on the operating um, performance, uh, aspects like social inflation, uh, they come into it, ESG-related uh, litigation uh, is, is slightly uh, new. Uh, the impact of uh, ESG integration and, uh, uh, and how that impacts on profitability is clearly something that uh, we are interested in. In the business profile itself, that's another building block. Uh, you're looking at underwriting exclusions, for example, that might uh, exist in that, changing demographics, the data uh, privacy issues and reputational risk aspects. So they, they're, they're fundamental uh, elements of that uh, building block assessment. And, and of course, ERM, uh, particularly around corporate governance and the stress testing. Uh, of uh, particularly climate-related uh, activities and risks, and the financial and non-financial uh, risks themselves are all part of that broader ERM uh, assessment. So we have explicitly, if you like, uh, integrated uh, the consideration of ESG factors already into the assessment methodology, uh, and they sit alongside the traditional you know, financial uh, factors that uh, we look at in terms of the credit rating uh, methodology itself. And of course, it's always important to remember that, um, uh, you know, particularly around investments, that, you know, those that go into um, 
uh, untested uh, technologies, for example, or, or startups, or taking uh, insurance risks that can't necessarily be reliably priced, say, uh, due to uh, lack of information, uh, may itself carry increased uh, mm. risk. So, uh, in terms of credit risk, so there, there's some of the, you know, uh, if you like, broader considerations that we're already taking into account in terms of uh, our rating methodology and credit risk assessments for, you know, pertaining to ESG. Terrific. So the insurance capital standard uh, that's being developed by the uh, IAIS is uh, near complete. Uh, I'm interested in how a CRA uh, such as AMBEST uh, will view the ICS and your perspectives being a distinguished fellow of the IAIS, no less, uh, in, in what this could mean for Asian markets in particular. Yeah, it's true. I do have a self-interest uh, in terms of being a regulator working for many, many, many years, not only on Solvency 2, but then on, uh, uh, and actually predated Solvency 2 in the ICAS in uh, the UK, uh, and then uh, through to the ICS. So, I mean, a lot of work has gone into uh, the ICS, and a lot of good work, and, and uh, the, the results, even if the US do the regulation uh, method, and that gets uh, approved, you know, we would uh, always support, you know, the efforts of, of regulators uh, more broadly uh, to uh, achieve better capital and risk management um, sophistication and analysis concerning, you know, capital and solvency positions. So right from the, the, the get-go, if you like, you say, well, the ICS is absolutely, you know, going to be helpful in that sense. Clearly, it's only going to uh, apply to the largest uh, groups. Uh, but notwithstanding, uh, it, it's going to at least advance the insurance sector forward. Because as a global standard setter, it's pretty odd, to be honest, if the IIS didn't actually have, as the global standard setter for insurance, a view and an approach on risk-based capital, which is effectively what the ICS is. So, you know, and, and it was, I wouldn't say forced, but it was certainly encouraged by you know, the Basel Committee to say, look, this is, this, this looks a little bit strange that uh, the insurance sector doesn't have something globally uh, recognised as a, as a capital standard. Uh, and so from that perspective, you go, yes, that actually intuitively does, you know, make sense and we should do something uh, about that. I guess the interesting issue is how they take that forward, mm -hmm. right? Now that I'm no longer a regulator, uh, but still obviously a keen uh, and interested close stakeholder at AMBEST. Uh, in Asia Pacific particularly, if you look at this region, uh, most of the supervisors, if we're honest, will only ever really be part players in, in most of those colleges that they have for those large insurance groups, because most of the large insurance groups are not really based here in. Asia Pacific. So a lot of those supervisors in our region here will be, you know, members of a college and they'll be basically looking at it from that perspective. So they're not really getting that necessarily involved with it. And so you're still going to have that dominated predominantly by, you know, European and other US uh, supervisors. So you look at that uh, and you think, okay, notwithstanding it could be a basis, if the IAS really wanted to, to actually use, a, use the ICS as a simplified model, mm -hmm. a simplified framework in which to actually take forward meaningful RVC development in the Asia Pacific region amongst a lot of the supervisory jurisdictions. So trying to implement ICS for most of them is going to be a little bit too much of a stretch, I think. Uh, but uh, something which is on a simplified basis and paired back, if you like, but using that construct as a good base uh, to, to take forward some of the development work that could happen here in jurisdictions where there aren't any RBC frameworks yet uh, is probably, you know, a, a good next step. Hmm. Okay. So it, it's true to say that the Asia-Pacific region is characterized by many uh, developing and emerging markets. Uh, so in, in this regard, uh, what does AMBEST see as some of the key issues in these markets? 
Well, I think the move to RBC frameworks and the implementation of ORSAs, you know, the own risk insolvency assessments. I mean, I just spent uh, about two months ago a, a whole day session, education seminar, we call it, in, uh, in Manila, you know, taking the Philippine industry through what the changes are going to look like, how it's going to impact them. And what you also realize is it's not just the industry players who need some assistance, because there's a real, there is a real skills and capability gap you know, in these markets. You're going from a very old Solvency I type regime to something which is much more sophisticated and enhanced in terms of, you know, the sort of, not necessarily the Solvency II model that we all think about of, of Europe, but just that next level of Solvency II uh, regulation, which is around risk-based capital, better risk and uh, capital um, analysis. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a big step change for a lot of these markets. You look at Indonesia, you know, the Philippines, Vietnam, India, you know, just to name a few, let alone, you know, the Cambodias or the Sri Lankas, you know. So you've, you've got a big, uh, you know, group of markets and, and supervisors who need a lot more, um, you know, uh, assistance. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really where it's going to, you know, be, uh, I think, a key issue for the IAS and others to, um, to step in and support going forward. Uh, so it's not just on the, on the industry side, it's actually very much on the regulatory and then how they implement that properly is actually uh, a really key uh, area. And of course, one of the things you do have is, is just a, a mere funding issue uh, for most of the supervisors because they don't actually just have the financial resources to you know, get outside uh, assistance and that in itself is, is effectively an issue. Because unless you can get the supervisors being able to start these frameworks and start the, the ball rolling, as it were, um, you, you're just never going to, never going to get there. So, uh, so somewhere, somehow, that needs to be addressed. And whether that comes through the World Bank or the IMF or others to try and facilitate, uh, but uh, that uh, is something that I think the IS is, is, is aware of and, and knows what to do. Well, last question, and putting your former regulatory hat back on just for a few minutes, where do you see the future uh, of insurance regulation, specifically in, in the Asia-Pacific region, uh, and then are there any emerging trends or issues that you may think might have more broader consequences globally? Well, I mean, what I just mentioned before around uh, the, the assistance on RBCs and, and risk frameworks, that that definitely needs to happen. And I think the, the implementation aspects uh, is, is something that the IS is very, very much keen uh, to uh, assist with. Uh, they've, they've, if you like, they've, they've got to the end of their policy making you know, uh, uh, cycle, if you like. And the next one is really about implementation mm -hmm. and then how they do that. And it's, it's not the Western markets that need that assistance. Most of them are all fairly well-established regulators who are financially, you know, well-resourced. It's, it's in these emerging and developing markets where there is a lot more assistance required. So that's a, that's a key area. Uh, so, you know, implementation assistance has to be top of, top of mm -hmm. mind, I would have thought. And, uh, and, and seeing what stakeholders can do generally to support those efforts is actually, you know, I, I think really important. The, um, the other one in terms of, uh, you know, perhaps regulatory change uh, going forward, and, and those risk-based capital and risk frameworks are, are big enough, but um, one interesting dynamic at the moment we've seen is uh, what uh, APRA has done in Australia. So uh, the regulator there has uh, been, I think, pretty innovative mm -hmm. in its policy making because it's actually now going to require for the first time carriers to undertake a risk assessment of their, what they call service providers. And service providers for APRA's definition include all the MGAs, so all the agents, and brokers. Right. So we, we haven't had that uh, in regulation globally yet. Uh, it's effectively, no one was able to, if you like, crack the nut on how to proactively supervise intermediaries. And so, uh, because of the sheer numbers, you know, so it's a very different basis to, of supervision. It's more compliance and rule-based and, uh, and fines, yeah, issuing if there's any breaches. Unlike on the prudential side where you have a much smaller subset 
uh, and you can get uh, a bunch of supervisors doing proactive supervision and looking at forward-looking uh, analysis. You haven't been able to do that on the intermediary side. So, uh, so this is going to be a real step change if that comes through. Uh, obviously, there's work for the, the carriers themselves to undertake that. Uh, how they implement that is going to be important. But you can see other regulators actually globally taking that up because it really does start for the first time to put the onus on those intermediaries to actually you know, look at their own uh, performance and have that nexus with the, uh, with the carriers. So that's one to watch. Oh, terrific. We are actually right on time. We're actually so we right do on have time, time for uh, a question. One or two. question, maybe. Yeah. One question. Should ratings be compulsory? Well, why not? <laughs> <laughs> if you're working for a rating company, I guess the answer is yes. <laughs> it would make my job easier. <laughs> that would certainly be true. Uh, look, I think in all seriousness, I mean, you, you, you saw this in New Zealand, yeah. you know, where uh, in the absence of an insurance regulatory framework, they basically, uh, in their wisdom, outsourced it effectively by saying you need to get at least uh, a rating. And it has a certain set of eyes, of course, uh, with uh, those analysts looking at, uh, uh, at the financial condition and future capital and solvency positions of insurers. So, that actually has a lot of merit in one sense where you have jurisdictions that are unable, if you like, to uh, have the necessary means to actually uh, undertake that sort of supervision intensity that ordinarily you would expect to see from other established Western type uh, jurisdictions. So, you know, in a lot of the emerging developing markets in Asia, that you could quite see how the regulators, and I've spoken to many of them, wouldn't be surprising to you, uh, who are very uh, keen on, um, uh, on seeing how they can complement their, their uh, supervisory efforts. Uh, because really, the, the job of an analyst at a CRA uh, is, is very, very uh, analogous to uh, what uh, an insurance supervisor does. So there is a lot of uh, you know, sense in, in uh, going down that route. But, um, well, we'll see, yeah. Thank you. Well, can we thank uh, Rob and Josh for that exciting session? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.